In this video, I want to kind of begin to introduce uh, generative adversarial networks, and uh, in order to discuss, uh, it's also called GANs for short, and in order to discuss these, we first have to discuss the two key words in generative adversarial networks, that's the generative part and the adversarial part. So we're going to talk about uh, both of those uh, today, and uh, so you'll get a better idea of why they're called generative adversarial networks, and then we'll later discuss actually what they are and how you train them and you know we'll, we'll get into the details of that uh, a bit later. Okay so first word you see is uh, generative that's part of the generative part of generative adversarial networks and uh, we have to make two distinct two or we have to make one distinction of two different kinds of uh, models right so you have uh, generative models what we call generative models and uh, we have uh, what is called discriminative models. So I'm going to talk about discriminative models first because they're probably most familiar to you, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, generative models. Okay, so a discriminative model is something that you give it an input and it computes the probability that an input belongs to a particular class. So this, um, I, I've written it down here, it, you, you're computing the probability uh, for a particular output class given the input. So, you know, what does this sound like? Well, this is pretty much the whole point of supervised classification, right? So you have some kind of, um, you have some kind of input that you're putting into a discriminative model, and then the whole point of the model is that you produce a probability distribution across all of the possible uh, classes. And so once you produce that uh, distribution, then you can just say, well, let me just select the, the class label that's, uh, that's this input pattern or that this input is you know, most likely to be. So that's pretty much just what uh, these, these discriminative uh, models are. They're usually used for things like supervised learning um, and um, but in particular for classification. And so the whole point of this is that you learn a, a model that can map an input X to a particular uh, class and then you know when you actually compute a probability distribution using softmax and then you can map it to a class by saying let's just take the um let's just take the maximum likelihood. Okay, so um you're probably familiar with it. so this shouldn't be like really new stuff. Um which is really just classification. But the new stuff here is uh now we have these things called generative models and these generative models instead of learning um, instead of gi you give them an input and um, you you know you want to build a probability distribution across the classes, what you're actually learning is you're learning the joint distribution of the inputs and the class labels, and this is this is different because this is different because you're not only building a probability distribution over the outputs, you're also building it over the inputs as well. And, you know, so so what does that mean? Uh, well, it's kind of, I kind of mentioned this in the, in the last point here is if you have a probability distribution over the input space, whether that be um, images or um, you know some any other kind of input, but you have, when you have a, a distribution of values over that, then you can actually use it to generate new inputs. And this is kind of what GANs are trying to do. You're trying to learn this generative model, this joint distribution of, of x and y. And if I want to be more specific actually um, for GANs, you don't need to provide them with a, a class label. Um, there are some flavors of GANs. Um, one of them is the auxiliary classifier GAN or AC GAN. That one actually does accept uh, class labels, and so you can actually model the joint. But um, for general GANs, you don't necessarily need to give it a, a ground truth label. So you can kind of use it as like, as like an unsupervised learning kind of thing. And so when we're discussing this with unsupervised learning, right, you um, usually model just p of x but and but you know in many cases you might also have the the uh, you know this can also be run on supervised data you just have to create the the joint distribution for that so um, that's you know pretty much how a generative models uh, work and they're i hesitate to say this a little bit but they're generally a bit harder to learn because you're trying to model a joint distribution and the distribution of the input space is generally much larger than um, or it you know, has more possible entries than it, than the output classes. You might have like 
10 apple classes, 1,000 apple classes, but you think of all the possible values that you can take across, you know, like a, a 28 by 28 image and grayscale image, you know, that's a lot of different values. And so these are generally a bit harder to learn well um, than the discriminative models, but, you know, there's obviously like edge cases that you might have to look into. And uh, as it turns out, you can actually, once you know the joint distribution, this is just a probability thing, once you know the joint distribution, you can compute a ton of different other things. So I can actually convert a generative model into a discriminative model using uh, these called it's called a chain rule of probability. You can actually just convert, go from generative to discriminative using this chain rule. You know, going from going the other way from discriminative to general, um, it's a bit. To, you can also use the chain rule to try to do that, but what, you, what ends up happening is you end up trying to model the joint distribution anyway. So it's so you're going from generative to discriminative. You know, you can do that as well. And people have done some work to see whether generative models are better than discriminative models. Like if you build a generative model first and then convert it to a discriminative model, you know, does that perform better than if you just started with a discriminative model? People are still kind of um, working working that out. And so after you have this um, this, this probability distribution over the, the inputs, uh, you can use this to generate new data. And that's what GANs are trying to do. You want to generate new data that's like indistinguishable from your training set, whatever you're training on. So if you're training this on like the, the MNIST uh, data set, you want to generate digits that aren't actually in the data set, but they look as if they could be in the data set. So we'll be getting to that a little bit later. So anyway, this is just the difference between discriminative and generative. The next, the, the next component of generative adversarial networks is the adversarial part. And so uh, the you know, people have done work in adversarial training and um, adversarial search also. And uh, so what I mean by adversarial is that you have at least two players, quote unquote players, that are kind of competing against each other. It's not a cooperation, this is an adversarial uh, thing. So you know, one example that's you know, easy to use is like Pac-Man or like really any other um, video game that you can think of. Um, you know, like, but Pac-Man is probably the simplest you know, you're Pac-Man, you're like moving around the moving around the grid, and there's these ghosts that are trying to eat you. You know, so uh, that is kind of an example of, of adversarial, and in particular, those games like that are probably using some kind of adversarial search, like a, there's an algorithm called Minimax that you, you can look into if you're curious about uh, adversarial search. But the the point of adversarial training is that you have like two different component two different uh, components or players that are trying to compete against each other and really interesting things happen and you can kind of analyze this using uh, things like game theory um, and that's actually kind of what GANs do a, a little bit and so you can kind of you know, figure out what's going to happen based on um, based on doing some, some game theory but anyway so that is um, kind of the adversarial part and we're going to see that uh, with GANs there is an adversarial component to this you have these, this thing called a generator and this thing called a discriminator, and they're going to be trying to like compete against each other. So there's so these, so these two guys are adversaries, and um, yeah. So we're going to see how we're, uh, we're we're going to see very soon with GANs how all these like different components kind of come together to uh, to work in tandem. So uh, I'm just going to stop this video here, and then um, in the next video we will discuss. You know, more in more depth uh, these generative uh, adversarial networks and so just to do a really quick recap when we discuss generative and discriminative uh, models and so with the discriminative models you're building a probability distribution over all the classes given a particular input so it's really just a classification task but with a generative model you actually want to want to have a probability distribution over the output and the input. And so you generally do this with a joint model of um, probability of x and y. Um, or if you're doing something like supervised learning, then you just really need the probability of x because you don't have any classes. And you can take a generative model, convert it to a discriminative model using uh, the chain rule of probability. And when you have this distribution over the inputs, you can use it to generate uh, new data. And so for adversarial training uh, is kind of like the second part of, of GANs and what you can do with Adversarial training is you can have like two components or two components that are kind of competing against each other. And so we're going to discuss all of this 
uh, in the context of GANs actually uh, in the next video.